Um, today, it's our distinct pleasure to welcome Dr. Seth Crockett to our GI Grand Rounds. Um, he's an associate, a tenured associate professor in the Department of Medicine, Division of Gastroenterology and Hepatology at University of, the no of North Carolina. He obtained his medical degree from Dartmouth Medical School and completed his residency in internal medicine, including a chief residency at Stanford. He then went on to do a research fellowship in GI epidemiology and a master's of public health, followed by a clinical fellowship in gastroenterology at UNC. His research focuses mainly on GI cancer epidemiology, screening and prevention of colorectal cancer and colonoscopy screening. And he's been awarded multiple NIH and other society grant awards for the investigation of the epidemiology and natural history of serrated polyps, as well as improving colorectal cancer screening outcomes. However, his expertise does not stop there at all. And he's played an active role in the development of multiple society guidelines, including first offering the 2019 AGA guideline on opioid induced constipation. And it's this topic that we are privileged today to have him discuss with us. Um, Dr. Crockett, we're really sorry that we can't have you here in person with us, but we are very thankful that you've accepted our, our invitation and you're here to talk to us today on opioid induced constipation. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for the um, uh, introduction and for the kind invitation to, to speak with you all today. Um, can everybody hear me and see me okay? Yeah, we see hearing and seeing. All right. Um, so I'll go ahead and share my screen. All right. Anybody see that? Yes. Okay. Um, so, um, as Yakir mentioned, the, the topic of the day is, is opioid-induced constipation and opioid-related um, GI conditions. Um, I, you know, I think this is, um, it may not be the most exciting topic, but I do think it's important for gastroenterologists to know about. Um, you will see patients um, with these disorders, um, and um, I'm going to focus a little bit more on, on the treatment options. Um, so, uh, and we'll also touch on the, the opioid epidemic um, and I'm gonna end with some cases to try and make this a little bit more practical. Um, all right. So these are my disclosures. Um, I'll just say I don't get any funding um, from the opioid, uh, uh, induced constipation drug manufacturers. Um, so with respect to epidemiology, chronic pain affects uh, 10 to 15% of the general population. A uh, majority of these patients use opioids um, and OIC affects at least 40% of patients taking uh, chronic opioids. Uh, it um, varies from either 20% to uh, all the way up to 80%, depending on the patient population uh, that you're talking about um, and the dose of opioids taken, of course. Um, so CDC estimates uh, around 200 um, million prescriptions for opioids uh, each year. Um, fortunately, this number is declining in recent years due to increased scrutiny of opioid prescribing and, and um, regulations uh, as well. Uh, but this is still a huge number. It's enough for one prescription for every uh, adult in the U.S. Um, per year, um, which is a staggering uh, amount of opioids. Um, this is not a uniquely uh, American problem, um, but we certainly do worse um, than um, other countries. Uh, U.S. prescribes far more opioids per capita than any other country, nearly twice as many. Um, as Canada, which is the number two nation. Um, it's also important to acknowledge the huge problem of opioid misuse in this country. Um, the worst problems associated with opioids um, are uh, certainly not constipation, but dependence um, and overdose deaths. Um, because of this, any any provider involved in the management of opioid side effects, um, such as OIC, has a role in making sure that opioids are being prescribed uh, appropriately, the patients are being 
uh, managed by either their primary care physicians or pain management programs, ideally under the auspices of a pain uh, contract um, to ensure that the drugs are not being diverted and that the patients are not uh, taking more uh, than they need. Um, so as I mentioned, you know, opioids uh, are responsible for um, a large number of overdose deaths, overdose deaths um, in this country, uh, far more than any other drug um, category. Um, in the past five years or so, this has mostly been due to um, synthetic opioids. Um, and part of the reason for this is the very narrow therapeutic uh, window of these drugs. Uh, so if you guys still do conscious sedation, you know that we measure uh, fentanyl in micrograms. Um, the lethal dose of fentanyl is around one to two milligrams um, given in bolus fashion. Uh, but for carfentanil, uh, which I believe was uh, originally a veterinary uh, drug used for uh, uh, developed for use in horses, um, the lethal dose is much lower. Um, and there are illicitly manufactured forms of fentanyl um, that are far and away the most commonly uh, used um, opioids in some parts of the country, such as West Virginia uh, and Ohio, um, that have caused waves of um, overdose deaths. And you may have heard about first responders um, also um, suffering respiratory depression when they came in contact with dust on the uh, bodies of uh, patients who are overdosing. Um, so this is extremely potent stuff. All right, so I'm going to um, switch gears a little bit. I'm going to try and show you this video. Um, and hopefully the audio will come through. If not, bear with me. It's only about a minute. Um, If you need an opioid to manage your chronic pain, you may be so constipated. It feels like everyone can go, except you. Tried many things, still struggling to find relief? You may have opioid-induced constipation, OIC. It's different and may need a different approach. Opioids block pain signals, but can also block activity in the bowel, which is why it can feel like your opioid pain med is slowing your insides to a crawl. Longing for a change? Have the conversation with your doctor about OIC and ask about prescription treatment options. Made on behalf of those living with chronic pain and struggling with OIC. All right. Uh, could you guys hear that? Yes, you could. Okay. <laughs> Very funny. <laughs> All right. Hi, everyone. It's me, Oscar Nunez. Now that the office is streaming on Peacock, Sorry. we've unearthed a ton of old bonus features. All right, let me stop that up. Sorry about that. All right. Okay. Can you see my uh, PowerPoint again? Yes. Yes. Okay. yes. All right. So um, this um, ad for OIC um, aired during the Super Bowl, uh, during Super Bowl 50 in 2016. Um, and you may have seen it um, if you're watching the Carolina Panthers lose to the uh, Denver Broncos. Um, it was seen by uh, over 111 million viewers. Um, the ad was sponsored by AstraZeneca and Daichi Sanko, the, the makers of Movantic, uh, which is naloxagol, one of the drugs specifically designed to treat OIC. Um, and it was estimated to cost around $10 million. Um, as you might imagine, this ad generated some controversy. Um, Dr. Andrew Kolodny, um, 
who I believe did some of his training at Mount Sinai, uh, is now the executive director of Physicians for Responsible Opioid Prescribing, uh, said it's very disturbing to see an ad like that. It's normalizing the chronic use of opioids, uh, which aren't demonstrated to be safe over the long term. Uh, Dennis McDonough, who was uh, the White House Chief of Staff for Obama at the time, said, um, next year, how about fewer ads that fuel opioid addiction and more on access to treatment? Um, and plugged a, um, a Senate bill uh, that was directed towards opiate treatment. Uh, Peter Schumlin, who is the uh, governor of Vermont at the time, said promoting drugs uh, during Super Bowl will uh, to help Americans take more opiates in the midst of our crisis. Big Pharma has no shame. And my favorite from the Burlington Police, uh, Big Pharma buys Super Bowl ad to warn about the most pressing effect of opiates, constipation. Thanks for nothing. Um, but I think the ad is sort of unusual. Um, for one, it's a pharmaceutical uh, company ad that never mentions um, the drug, Movantic. Um, it's uh, really about defining and promulgating this condition of OIC to the general public, presumably um, to indirectly lead patients um, to treatment. Um, and I think the use of humor um, and sort of this average Joe um, New Yorker um, is an attempt to try to destigmatize opioid, uh, opioid use. Um, um, and I think another reason that this may have been controversial is that OIC is, um, is really an iatrogenic um, man-made condition. Nobody is born with OIC um, or you know, has a genetic defect that causes it. Um, it's purely a side effect of taking opioids, which as I've just showed you, um, are way overprescribed um, in this country. Um, and it also gave me a little bit of anxiety seeing that guy rub up against uh, a bunch of other pedestrians on the street uh, in these COVID days. But, um, so um, what do opioids do in the GI tract? Uh, opioids can cause a range of uh, adverse effects in both the upper and the lower GI tract. They exert their uh, GI effects on um, kappa receptors in the stomach and small intestine. Um, and uh, mu receptors uh, located in the small intestine and proximal colon. Uh, in the lower GI tract, uh, opioids activate enteric mu receptors, uh, which results in increased um, tonic non-propulsive contractions of the small and large intestine, increased colonic fluid absorption and stool desiccation. Um, opioids are also thought to increase the, the minimum sensory threshold of the rectum and increase anal sphincter tone. And the sum of these effects uh, results in harder stool and less frequent and less effective um, defecation. Um, so uh, OIC is not the only defined uh, opioid related GI conditions and I wanted to touch on some of these other uh, conditions as well. Opioid induced bowel dysfunction is really an umbrella term. It's uh, refers to the set of GI adverse effects associated with opioid therapy, uh, including not only constipation, but also um, GERD, nausea and vomiting, bloating, um, and abdominal pain. I think we've all seen patients on opioids who've had uh, one or more of these uh, symptoms. Opioid-induced constipation uh, is simply the development of constipation due to initiation of opioids, and we'll talk about the formal definition in a little bit. Uh, there's also an emerging condition called opioid-induced esophageal dysfunction, uh, which is abnormal esophageal motility related to chronic opioid use, um, and uh, narcotic bowel syndrome, um, which is a paradoxical increase in abdominal pain despite escalating doses of opioids, also called opioid-induced central hyperalgesia. Um, so most of the talk is going to focus on OIC, but I, you know, as I said, I will touch on these other conditions as well. Um, so uh, the opioid-induced bowel um, dysfunction is estimated to affect at least half of patients taking chronic opioid use. Again, um, uh, depends on the uh, dose of opioids used um, and the duration to a certain extent. Um, Opioid-induced constipation, at least 40% um, can be higher uh, given those factors as well. And narcotic bowel syndrome is estimated to affect around 5% of opioid users and they don't necessarily uh, uh, have uh, OIC or other um, GI effects apart from abdominal pain. So the Rome 4 criteria for um, OIC um, are new or worsening constipation when initiating, changing, or increasing opioid 
the therapy that includes two or more of the following, uh, straining to defecate, heart or lumpy stool consistency, sense of incomplete rectal eva evacuation or anal rectal blockage, uh, manual maneuvers to facilitate defecation, um, or fewer than three spontaneous bowel movements per week uh, with loose stools, rarely present without the use uh, of laxatives. Um, these are the treatment options um, for OIC, and they include traditional uh, over-the-counter laxatives, uh, osmotic laxatives, uh, prototypical one being uh, Miralax, uh, which of course draw water into the intestine and hydrate and soften the stool. Uh, stimulant laxatives such as bisicodal or Senna, um, which uh, stimulate colonic motility. Uh, both of these are very inexpensive and available over-the-counter. Um, the uh, Pomora agents or peripherally acting mu opioid receptor antagonist agents, um, which have specific um, activity uh, in the gut to counter the effects of opioids. Um, and the, these include uh, nildemidine or simproic, naloxagol or movantic, uh, methanaltrexone uh, or Relistor, which was the first um, kit on the block, uh, as well as alvimapan, which is not FDA approved for, for OIC. Um, but is used for post-operative ileus. Um, and uh, some other drugs that we use for constipation have also been evaluated for uh, OIC specifically, including lubiprostone uh, or amitiza and procalipride. Uh, and there is some data for uh, linaclotide uh, as well, which I'll show you. Um, these proprietary prescription um, medications uh, tend to be much more expensive uh, than the over-the-counter um, uh, laxatives, um, which can be a barrier to treatment. Um, so how do these Pomora agents work? Um, on the left column here is normal uh, gut motility. Um, the middle column shows the effects of opioids, not only um, centrally, but on the um, gut causing non-propulsive uh, propulsive motility um, and um, blocking intestinal secretion, leading to desiccated stools, as well as effects on the uh, anal sphincter mechanism and pomoros, uh, basically by um, uh, blocking those, uh, the um, activation of those mu receptors um, counteract those effects. Um, so um, as Yakira mentioned, I was fortunate to be a part of the AGA guideline panel to look at treatments for um, OIC uh, along with a group of smart and talented colleagues um, where we reviewed the um, literature on therapeutic options for this disorder. Um, and the findings were published in a technical review um, as well as the guideline statement. Um, for, as you may know, the AGA guidelines follow a rigorous uh, grade methodology, which essentially involves conducting separate systematic reviews for each uh, guideline topic or question. Um, this framework is designed to create guidelines uh, that um, are um, that are um, evidence-based and um, generally free of bias, or at least that's the goal. Um, and these are the recommendations that came out of that process. Um, there were uh, strong or conditional recommendations for a uh, use of traditional laxatives uh, first line. Um, and for those who fail uh, first line treatment um, to use these uh, peripherally acting uh, mu receptor antagonists, um, uh, including um, neldemidine, naloxagol, and methyl naltrexone. Um, so I'll go through these um, one by one. Um, so for um, laxatives, uh, this recommendation was based on one randomized control trial on two open label studies uh, in OIC patients that demonstrated uh, effectiveness of both osmotic and stimulant laxatives. Um, we also use data from two meta-analyses of uh, the use of laxatives in chronic idiopathic constipation, a related condition. Uh, that found that uh, both classes of laxatives were more effective than placebo with a very low number needed to treat. Um, laxatives uh, are also used as a rescue therapy in a majority of OIC trials. Um, and as you know, generally very safe, low cost and available over the counter. Um, 
we recommended that um, providers use a combination of at least two uh, types of laxatives, so osmotic and stimulant laxatives, um, before throwing in the towel uh, and escalating therapy. Um, so for naldemidine or Simproic, uh, which is a Pomora agent, um, we found strong evidence uh, for use of this agent in patients who have laxative refractory OIC. Um, and this comes from four, four separate randomized control trials um, that uh, had a pooled uh, relative risk for SBM response, which is basically an um, FDA uh, defined uh, endpoint for constipation trials, uh, the spontaneous bowel movements per week um, of 1.51, that was statistically significant. Um, there were also some other effects on uh, SBM frequency, reduction in straining, and improvement in stool consistency. Uh, there was not a meaningful change in quality of life, um, and the absolute uh, increase in adverse events was low. Um, but again, you know, cost may limit the, uh, some patients' access to this uh, drug. Uh, it's not covered by all insurance. Uh, uh, for naloxagol or Movantic, um, there were um, uh, three separate randomized control trials that were examined, um, and the pooled um, relative risk for this drug was 1.43, again, statistically significant, um, and it was also associated with increased uh, SBM frequency and, and uh, straining and stool cons improvement in stool consistency. Um, Adverse events were more common in patients treated with Movantic, which uh, most of these includes uh, diarrhea, but also some abdominal pain um, and headache. Um, this agent uh, is about the same cost as uh, Simprolic, um, so cost again is a factor. Um, for methylnaltrexone or Relistor, um, there was uh, somewhat weaker uh, quality evidence, um, but still. Um, looks to be a significant, a statistically significant benefit. So this was a conditional recommendation. Um, and that's mostly because the studies that evaluated um, Relistor were of shorter duration. Um, and there were some issues with the uh, responder definition and limited data on other uh, patient reported outcomes. Um, and um, at the time of the, our analysis, um, the data on lubiprostone and procalipride was fairly limited. Um, and um, therefore, um, the panel uh, judged these to be evidence gaps, uh, essentially not uh, felt that there wasn't enough data uh, to issue a recommendation for or against use of these agents. Um, so that's sort of, um, it in terms of the, um, the outcome of those guidelines, you should be aware of sort of that general framework and we'll go through um, a treatment algorithm in a moment. Um, as I mentioned, there is some data for, you know, this is an evolving topic. Um, there is some data for uh, linaclotide, which has a different mechanism uh, of those other drugs that we looked at. Um, this, these are data from a phase two study. Um, and uh, it's likely moving forward with phase three, so we'll um, see what happens um, there. So I think this is a helpful algorithm um, if you, um, for providers who are encountering patients who may have uh, uh, opioid-induced uh, constipation, uh, really the first task is to evaluate, um, like you would any constipation patient, um, for other causes of constipation, uh, think about medications, comorbid illness, uh, whether or not there are uh, features of pelvic outlet dysfunction or mechanical obstruction, um, looking at things like electrolyte abnormalities um, and uh, activity level, fluid intake, that sort of thing. Um, diagnosis um, based on those realm criteria, again, is a change from baseline bowel habits coinciding with the initiation of opioid therapy with those um, features. Um, if you do encounter other reasons for constipation, it's important to treat those uh, accordingly uh, first um, because um, patient's constipation may resolve um, with, um, with addressing those issues and you may not necessarily um, need to uh, specifically address the um, 
uh, opioid uh, induced uh, component um, if that's a minor contributor. Um, if you do confirm that patients have OIC, um, it's important to assess for misuse or abuse, uh, minimize narcotics and make sure that they're on the minimally uh, required dose to treat their pain condition, um, working if necessary with their um, pain management physicians or primary care doctors. Um, you can consider alternative agents. There are some uh, opioid uh, preparations that have uh, uh, antagonists um, accompanying them, which may be associated with um, less constipation. Uh, opioid switching may be, um, may be an option as well. So uh, looking for uh, an equine analgesic uh, form of opioids uh, that may be less constipating. For example, uh, morphine preparate, morphine-based preparations tend to be more constipating than uh, fentanyl, for example. Um, and lifestyle recommendations, so making sure that they have adequate fluid intake, fiber intake, uh, regular ex exercises tolerate, uh, tolerated and appropriate toileting practices. Um, so uh, responding to the urge to defecate um, when they get it. Um, if uh, once you've done this, then uh, proceed with laxative uh, treatment. Again, this is a strong recommendation, trying at least two types of laxatives um, at a scheduled dose, not just PRN. Uh, because patients tend not to take them or take them inappropriately when not given uh, explicit instructions. Um, and if they have an adequate response to this, um, uh, consider escalating to one of the Pomora uh, evidence or Pomora agents that has good evidence uh, for efficacy. Um, so I wanna back up a little bit and talk about narcotic bowel syndrome, which I mentioned earlier in the talk. Um, the room for diagnostic criteria for, um, for NBS or opioid induced hyperalgesia are chronic uh, or frequently recurring abdominal pain um, that is treated with acute high dose or chronic narcotics. Uh, the nature of the, and the intensity of the pain is not explained by current or previous uh, GI uh, diagnosis. Um, and includes two or more of the following. The pain worsens or incompletely resolves with uh, continued or escalating doses of narcotics um, and markedly intensifies when the narcotic dose is reduced uh, and subsides when narcotics are reinstituted. And this is a soar and crash phenomenon. Um, and there's typically a progression of the frequency, duration, and intensity of pain episodes. Um, so um, treatment for this disorder, um, really it's, you know, it's characterized by this paradoxical relationship where patients are taking you know, high-dose narcotics but are still having very severe abdominal pain. Um, and really the problem is the narcotics themselves uh, get into this sort of vicious cycle of taking more and more narcotics for their abdominal pain, which is actually making it worse. Um, so detoxification sometimes in the inpatient setting has been, um, has been effective where patients are um, transitioned uh, to a uh, um, dose of uh, opioids that is gradually um, tapered off and their symptoms of withdrawal are supported during that period. Um, unfortunately, there's a fairly high recidivism rate uh, for this disorder, so it does require continued uh, close follow-up. Um, another kind of rare complication, which we have seen here and maybe you've seen there as well, um, is stercoral ulceration and perforation in patients with um, chronic constipation and obstipation related to opioids. Um, uh, it can actually uh, lead to perforation of the bowel, which um, is a potentially fatal uh, consequence, uh, carries a mortality rate uh, upwards of 40 to 50%. Um, uh, we had a patient with this a few years ago. Uh, who uh, was an elderly woman who um, was living alone um, and had been taking uh, escalating doses of opioids uh, unbeknownst to her family um, and came in with a, a, an acute abdomen. Um, fortunately, she, she survived, but um, this is obviously a, a potentially serious complication. Um, and uh, I also wanted to mention, again, uh, opioid-induced esophageal dysfunction. Um, this is an emerging um, entity, but you should certainly be aware of it. Um, I have a patient that I'm following um, with this uh, right now. Um, it's defined as esophageal motor dysfunction in patients who are taking chronic opioids. Uh, the mechanism is really unclear. It's not uh, due to mu receptors um, necessarily, but it's thought to be 
um, related to opioids interfering with inhibitory signaling, uh, which causes spastic contractility and impaired relaxation of the um, EG junction. Uh, the manometric findings, uh, which I think are the most important things to remember, uh, include EGJ outflow obstruction, uh, distal esophageal spasm, uh, jackhammer esophagus, and even achalasia uh, type 3 uh, can be related to opioid use. Um, these uh, effects are worse with uh, stronger opioids and higher doses, which is not surprising. All right. Um, so in the last part of the talk, I wanted to go through a few cases that I think are um, illustrative. I'd like to make this um, a little bit interactive if we can. So um, particularly for the fellows, um, if you are willing to um, type your um, responses in the um, chat, um, and we can uh, kind of roll through these. So uh, first is a six-year-old woman uh, referred for hemorrhoids that I saw about six months ago. Um, she had frequent anorectal pain and bleeding with defecation. Uh, but also, in further questioning, um, had a history of chronic constipation uh, with bowel movements only once every three to four days, hard stools, difficulty defecating, um, a sensation of incomplete evacuation. Um, and she'd actually had a prior hospitalization for obstipation requiring uh, disinfection. Um, she also had abdominal pain and bloating that it was improved with bowel movements. Um, and she uh, takes Percocet three to four times per week for fibromyalgia and migraines, um, but does not use routine laxatives or daily laxatives, just uses them as a rescue therapy. Um, on rectal exam, she had hard stool in the vault, minimal pelvic descent and sphincter contraction uh, with strain maneuver. Um, uh, she did have internal hemorrhoids and a fissure um, on anoscopy. Um, so what would you do? Um, any of the fellows, I'll pick on uh, Yakira and Zoe since they uh, they invited me to give this talk. Um, what, what do you guys think? you want us to think? say it or type it in? Uh, either way. Um, I would definitely encourage reduction of narcotics as Dave said in the chat. But additionally, rectal therapy, given the large rectal stool burden, and then try to either maximize fiber or start her on something like Miralax's first line before moving to a more intensive therapy that you were describing earlier. Great. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, but in so, addition to that, um, you mentioned like she had like minimal pelvic descent, um, anal sphincter contraction with straining. So suggest also an element of pelvic floor dysfunction as well in her. Yeah, great. So yeah, this so this lady clearly has chronic constipation uh, with it's likely multifactorial uh, with contributions from IBS, um, opioid therapy, uh, as well as some suggestion of pelvic floor dysenergia on exam at least. Um, so when I initially saw her, I recommended a bowel cleanout. It's I think that's often helpful in patients with chronic constipation, especially if they have stool in the uh, vaults on exam. You just want to kind of um, reset the. Uh, their system and get everything out of there to start. And then we talked about a, a daily uh, bowel regimen uh, that was fairly aggressive that you would take um, every day, including uh, kind of a backbone of an osmotic laxative as well as a stimulant laxative. And I usually start patients uh, not necessarily on daily stimulant laxatives, but you know at least three times a week. And you can um, titrate that based on their response. Just be careful uh, of cramping that can accompany use of frequent center or uh, bisacodal. Um, and also lifestyle recommendations, fluid intake, uh, making sure she's getting enough fiber, trying to uh, encourage her to get at least some exercise. Uh, we of course discussed uh, reducing her narcotic use, minimizing that, uh, especially since she uh, was taking it for somewhat questionable um, reasons and then set her up for an interrectal manometry study. Um, so on her second visit, she'd had a slight improvement in constipation after, con after her clean out and increased laxatives, but still was having um, less than satisfactory um, stool output, was bothered by bloating, abdominal pain, um, still intermittent rectal bleeding and pain. Um, and she had had her interrectal manometry study, which did uh, document pelvic floor dysenergia. Um, so at this point, she, you know, I, I felt had had an adequate trial of laxatives and recommended because of this, um, you know, underlying IBS or chronic idiopathic constipation, 
uh, felt that she would be a good candidate for um, a secretagogue therapy like uh, like linaclotide, and we also referred her to pelvic floor biofeedback therapy. Um, and uh, when I next saw her, she was doing much better. She had reduced her dose of narcotics. I was no longer using the, these with the same frequency. Constipation and bloating were improved with linaclotide, and she was having bowel movements most days. Uh, she was working with uh, pelvic uh, floor physical therapy and having more successful bowel movements, um, and her fissure had essentially resolved. Um, so this is, um, you know, if we go back to that algorithm, this is somebody who sort of fell out on the top uh, after treating uh, the other causes of constipation. We didn't actually need to kind of go down the OIC pathway. Um, all right, so case two um, is a 72 year old man with stage four multiple myeloma, multiple bony metastases. Um, he'd had normal bowel habits until his myeloma diagnosis. Um, for his bone pain, he was taking MS Contin and um, Vicodin for breakthrough, um, was having bowel movements every two to three days, hard stool straining, uh, bloating and cramping that was relieved with defecation, no blood in the stool um, or significant dyskesia. Um, he eats a healthy high fiber diet, gets adequate fluid intake, um, exercises um, daily. Um, he had been started on uh, daily Miralax and Senna by his oncologist three months ago um, and really had only slight improvement um, and had actually cut back on his opiate use due to uh, constipation, which uh, was resulting in worsened pain, uh, less mobility, and poor sleep. Um, his rectal exam um, was essentially unremarkable. Um, he had normal sphincter tone, no stool in the vault. His uh, pelvic uh, descent and sphincter uh, function appeared to be uh, normal um, and did not have any uh, fissure. Um, so what would you do here? I'm one of the fellows I can answer. I mean, I think this is a isolated case of opiate induced constipation. It doesn't sound like he had any issues before. He has a sort of healthy lifestyle and it doesn't sound like he's gonna be able to reduce his opiates with a good functional status given his multiple myeloma. So I would just treat it with something like Movantix. Good, yes, perfect. So this is, uh, this is sort of a chip shot, but this is the kind of thing you might see on a board um, exam. Um, so this is a prototypical case of opiate induced constipation that is refractory to traditional laxatives. Um, so when we saw him, uh, recommended that he continue Mir Miralax um, as sort of a backbone drug that thought that he was a good candidate for a Pomora therapy uh, and was started on Neldemidine or some Proic, uh, 0.2 milligrams a day. Um, and uh, when we saw him back in follow-up, his constipation and bloating had essentially resolved, um, although he was, you know, kind of posse symptomatic. Um, and uh, you know, sort of a stoic guy, but um, had uh, said that his symptoms were uh, much better um, and was having satisfactory bowel movements every one to two days. Uh, and most importantly, he was able to um, get better pain control um, and move about a little bit better and, and um, his sleep was improved as well. All right, so last case um, was one of mine, I think, uh, from fellowship. Um, it was a 57-year-old woman referred for abdominal pain and chronic pancreatitis. Um, she had undergone an ERCP for a um, bit of a questionable indication, but it sounded like it was for sphincter of OD dysfunction um, three years before I saw her. Uh, and unfortunately developed a severe case of post ERCP pancreatitis um, requiring an ICU stay, prolonged hospitalization, uh, and actually was on TPN uh, for a period after that, uh, but it had subsequently been tapered off uh, in part due to the fact that she'd had multiple um, uh, DVTs in her upper extremities from um, lines, um, and uh, ultimately they were able to uh, get her to take enough nutrition by mouth that they could stop her TPN. Um, 
but she had had ongoing pain following this episode and was given a diagnosis of chronic pancreatitis, uh, which was treated with um, narcotics, including oxycontin and oxycodone. Uh, but despite this um, reported uh, needing increasing doses of narcotics over time and ongoing severe abdominal pain, she also had chronic constipation, but it was generally responsive to um, osmotic laxatives. Um, her exam, she had tenderness to light palpation throughout, no rebound, and she had a positive Carnet sign, which is that uh, pain that's accentuated when you ask the patient to engage their um, their rectus sheath muscles by, by sitting up. Um, her labs showed normal uh, biochemical uh, tests for uh, pancreas and uh, pedobiliary system. And she'd actually had an upper EUS done at Duke, uh, which as you may know, is down the road from us. Um, uh, recently before I saw her, which demonstrated a normal uh, pancreatic duct, pancreatic parenchyma, parenchyma with no calcifications. Um, so what do you guys think here? Uh, Chris DeMaio, do you think she uh, needs a, a Pusto procedure for chronic pancreatitis or uh, um, alcohol ablation for chronic pancreatitis uh, pain? I'm kidding. Any of the fellows? Uh... I mean, maybe it's it's Dave Greenwald. I mean, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, celiac plexus injection, something. Right. Yeah, but I mean, like, she doesn't really have anything on the US that suggests right. chronic pancreatitis. Right. So that's the wrong topic for this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think a carnet sign is probably more suggestive of like a hypersensitivity or kind of somatic type of abdominal pain. So I would try to um, deescalate opioids and maybe consider other um, pain management uh, options um, and uh, probably increase laxative options as well. Yeah, good. Um, so we actually, um, and she'd had cross-sectional imaging as well, which showed, you know, essentially normal, normal looking um, pancreas. Um, and what I didn't tell you, uh, I didn't give you all the information, but you know, she wasn't having any diarrhea or symptoms of, uh, you know, malabsorption uh, that would go along with that. I think she had a normal uh, fecal elastase too, um, and was actually somewhat overweight. Um, so we thought that she actually did not really have much evidence of chronic pancreatitis as an indication for, um, or as a reason for abdominal pain or an indication for narcotics, and actually felt that she probably just had narcotic bowel syndrome, um, perhaps with a background of, uh, of IBS um, or functional abdominal pain. So, so actually recommended that she try and taper off um, narcotics. Uh, we had offered her an inpatient stay to do this, but she really didn't want to do that. She wanted to try and do it as an outpatient. Um, so I worked with um, one of my colleagues, Doug Drossman, who uh, you may be familiar with, um, and uh, gave her prescriptions for, um, for clonazepam, for anxiety, duloxetine, and, and catiapine for central pain modulation to support her as she was uh, coming off narcotics. Um, and this can be a long process. I mentioned that the sort of de-escalation for narcotic bowel syndrome. Um, uh, in subsequent visits, she um, had been successful in gradually decreasing narcotic usage, uh, but had good days and bad days. Um, and she was pretty motivated. She, re she recognized that, you know, narcotics were not good for her um, and, you know, really had a goal of getting off them. Um, but eventually, um, she was able to come completely off, um, and with that, her abdominal pain, uh, constipation, and bloating significantly improved, um, and she um, subsequently was able to taper off this um, other uh, medications. Um, and I have seen her a few times since uh, then um, when she's had uh, flares, which tend to correspond with psychosocial uh, stressors, um, but those have been successfully managed without uh, use of narcotics. So. Um, and I think that's all I have for you. Um, so it went a little bit uh, over, but I'm happy to take um, any questions that you guys have. Um, I have one. It's Dave Greenwald. That was terrific, by the way. And it's such a common problem. 
that we see and everybody kind of throws their hands up and says, you know, oh yeah, they're taking too many opiates. Like, what do we do? Kind of thing. But we, we've had a, we've had a, a whole, first of all, I love the Super Bowl ad comments at the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, I think it makes it, it makes it real because that's really what people see. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, and it's such, it sort of promoted this like quick and easy solution to a problem, but it really is a problem that a lot of people have. Um, and, um, and we know the medical, um, we know the medical indications for use of chronic opiates. So like that second case you presented, I mean, it's a real problem yeah. for um, certain people. But so we've had a lot of problems with stercal ulcers, um, it seems when I've been on service recently. And, um, you know, really bad ulcerations, bleeding, and we had a patient almost exsanguinate on us hmm. uh, for bleeding. So, you know, I'm interested in, in the setting of opioid induced constipation or just your patients with constipation. Like, how do you, what's your practical guide for us for treating that? So, um, you know, stercoros, and these are ulcers, these are inpatients, and it's related to constipation because, you know, it's, we've, we've seen some of these ulcers that are related to the, um, you know, stool management system, um, uh, balloons that are in for a prolonged period of time. And, no, it's and a stool, stool, like just heavy constipation, you know? Yeah. So sometimes, you know, there's uh, solitary rectal ulcer syndrome, which is um, related, but it's sort of a different, um, a different phenomenon. And that probably has more to do with, um, you know, kind of prolapse and, and compromised um, vascular uh, vascularization of a particular area of the rectum. And then there's pure stercoral ulceration, which is um, from, you know, a concretion of stool pressing up against um, the um, rectum and, um, uh, and causing, you know, an injury just from mechanical abrasion um, of that area. Um, it can be, you know, it, it, both of those uh, can be hard to treat, obviously, for, for stercoral ulcerations. The most important thing is, you know, disimpacting that patient, getting them on a bowel regimen where uh, there's no further injury. Um, but it can take a while um, to heal. Um, I And this is sort of related, but I recently had a patient who had, you know, bad ulceration following APC treatment of... Um, radiation proctitis and had a huge ulcer in his rectum um, and actually had to divert him, uh, diverting ileostomy uh, to facilitate um, healing of that. Uh, now there are other issues in that scenario with in terms of the radiation effects on the vasculature, but yeah, um, in good. severe cases, sometimes you know that needs to be considered as well. Thanks. Thanks for a great presentation. I, um, you know, just looking at some of the data or the odds ratios you presented with um, some of these novel drugs for opiate induced constipation. Um, I mean, they're not that impressive with an odds ratio of one three, one four, one five. In your experience, how effective are these? You know, we're talking about a refractory population that's already presumably gone through osmotics and stimulant laxatives. Um, do you really see a significant percentage of your patients get some improvement? Um, what's been your take? Yeah, so I mean, it, I think they can. I think it, the patient population really has to be well curated. The patients who fail are those where um, you're, you know, somebody has reached to one of these medications too soon, um, and they haven't effectively dealt with um, some of the other contributors to the constipation, or the patient is just on so uh, such a high dose of narcotics that you're spitting into the wind. Um, but I certainly have seen, you know, I think um, I think they can truly be, be effective. It's um, you just need to, um, you know, really make sure that um, uh, that you know they are in that patient category that that uh, was in those clinical trials. You know, patients who are truly uh, on a stable dose of of opioids um, and have laxative refractory. Um, constipation. I think those are the patients who have uh, the best success. Um, but, uh, you know, the other thing I'll mention parenthetically is that uh, there are a lot of these patients that we just don't see. Um, pain management physicians prescribe these medications a lot. Um, oncologists do for patients with cancer pain. Um, so um, usually the patients who end up in our clinic are those who have 
um, you know, other issues um, or um, are, you know, are, are really refractory and those, you know, patients are obviously more complicated. Thanks so much for that presentation, Dr. Crockett. Um, yep. How long do you anticipate you would have to wait to see a response to tapering opioids in terms of like narcotic bowel syndrome? How long do we have to wait before we see some improvement in their symptoms? I mean, it can be fairly immediate. Um, so, um, I, you know, I don't do as much of this as, you know, my uh, functional colleagues, um, but, you know, there are certainly reports of patients who go through this inpatient detox um, regimen and are, you know, haven't been able to eat without, you know, crippling abdominal pain and are, you know, eating a, um, a regular diet on the day of discharge. Um, so it can be, it can be fairly immediate, but, you know, again, it requires close follow-up because, um, you know, if fairly high proportion of these patients will go back to using narcotics within a year. Thank you. Hi, can I ask a question? It's Alana Mazer. Yeah. Hi. So uh, have you ever tried, um, you know, doubling the dose of these drugs? Is it dangerous? Did you see any effect? I mean, I know that there is a recommended dosing schedule, but I see patients doing this on their own. And mm -hmm. I worry a little bit because I don't know, um, you know, the effects. Have you yeah. ever seen that? I mean... I, I have seen that. I mean, I tend to stick to um, the, you know, FDA recommended doses. Um, but, you know, that being said, I do think um, it's probably safe for them to use higher dose, you know, a, a doubling of dose, for example, the adverse events that people get with these drugs um, tend to be, you know, diarrhea is far and away the uh, the main one, but, you know, abdominal pain, um, that sort of thing. Severe adverse events are fairly, fairly rare. There's no black box warning for these drugs um, or, um, you know, anything else that's come out in terms of um, surveillance, post-marketing surveillance. Um, uh, but, you know, these are newer medications. Um, I think Movantic, uh, the New England Journal paper, um, phase three trial, I think it was 2014, um, and FDA approval following that. So, you know, these, we don't have a whole lot of uh, surveillance data. So, you know, it's certainly possible that um, adverse effects are going to creep, creep up or uh, appear with uh, more real world um, usage. Okay, thank you. All right, great. Well, uh, thank you again for the um, invitation. I look forward to the uh, time when I can uh, get back uh, to visit New York. I think it was one of the last places um, I traveled to before the pandemic um, hit. But hopefully we'll be able to gather in person uh, at some point in the near future. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Crockett. Have a great day, a great week, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.